Hello, I just got on the line. How are you? I'm, I'm good. It's good to hear from you again. What's going on? Oh, well, um, we have a new name for this segment. Okay. We're calling it Midweek Know Well. Okay. And the reason is is that, you know, Midweek Lyft was a play on words because I was driving for Lyft, L-Y-F-T, and I, I talked about the most uplifting passengers I drove that week, and I'm currently taking a break from that to protect my loved ones. Okay. But as you know... For years, I've been getting a lift from delving into the histories of old Christmas carols and finding ways to apply those pearls of wisdom to our world today. And I do this every week, all through the year. So with your permission, I'd like to share what I find and help you know well your know wells. That sounds great to me. I think it's great. So we need to tell the audience, though, and so it is, it is May, right? And we're talking <laughs> about a, a, a message from Christmas because tell the audience, uh, Defeating Scrooge is the main title of your, of your book. But what about that subtitle, which actually brings in everything that we want to talk about today? Right. Uh, so how to harness the power of Christmas carols to revive your spirit any time of year. Everybody says that, Renee, that people would like to hold on to the spirit of Christmas throughout the year. And I, obviously, you're the person who does that, and you're going to help us with a story today. What is that? <laughs> I am. Well, today I'm thinking about angels. Okay. So in my deep dive into carols, I, I looked into one that my caroling company doesn't yet have in our book. It's not as well known as some of the others, but for some people, it's their favorite. Angels from the Realms of Glory. Uh, the uh, lyrics are by the poet James Montgomery. He was born in Scotland in 1771. And his father was the only Moravian minister in Scotland at the time. And both of his parents were missionaries who left him when he was still a child to serve in Barbados, where they, well, both died. Mm -hmm. Now that might shake the faith of some people. Sure. But Montgomery's faith remained strong. So he grew up, left Scotland for England, and would eventually write the words to about 400 hymns. So the lyrics to Angels from the Realms of Glory are something you might very well find in your church hymnal. Here's the first verse. Angels from the realms of glory, when your flight o'er all the earth, ye who sang creation story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship Come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. Now, those lyrics were first published as a poem on Christmas Eve, 1816, in the Sheffield Iris, the English newspaper which Montgomery edited. Uh -huh. Now, in addition to being <clears throat> a poet, a hymn writer, and a journalist, James Montgomery was also, are you sitting? I'm sitting. A social activist. Oh, dun, dun, dun. there we go. So, before that newspaper was the Sheffield Iris, it was the Sheffield's Register, a political newspaper that spoke truth to power, which, of course, didn't please the power or the government. So, at one point, the owner had to flee to escape imprisonment and persecution. Oh, is crime? Organizing a Sheffield Society for Constitution Information, which was a, a local club of citizens interested in observing what it was that their government did in their name. Scandalous. So, Montgomery took over the newspaper and renamed it the Sheffield Irish. Now, as I said, he himself had a muscular sense of social justice, and he continued the tradition of speaking truth to power through his newspaper, and that got him in trouble. The leaders of the day didn't like that, so he was imprisoned twice in the York Castle Prison for speaking truth to power, for publishing a poem. But who do you think he finds himself surrounded by? Not dangerous criminals, but radical thinkers, philosophical freedom fighters, and kindred spirits. The only visitors he had were birds, loyal birds who came in his window every day. Hmm. So he wrote a, a whole slew of poems, many of them about birds, because he felt like a caged bird. Now, some of his poetry was actually getting out and being published in his paper. And when he was released, he was a celebrity. He took the poems that he wrote in prison and he published them in a book called Prison Amusements. But as I was studying Montgomery, I found that his story and works have inspired modern-day prison poetry programs. Say that five times fast. I won't try. I promise. <laughs> but isn't that amazing? I, mean, I just yeah. love digging into these carols and 
tell writers and finding out how they still inspire today in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. There are modern prison poetry programs all over the United States today led by volunteers. And I was watching a video of one classroom. So Andrew, a former heroin addict, 14 years in jail for armed robbery. He said, I could not live without the reading and the writing. One of the worst things about being in prison is not just the hopelessness and the powerlessness. It's the fact that you feel like you're living a purposeless existence. And one of the things that writing does for me is to give me purpose, serious purpose. So now you may be wondering how angels fit into all of this. Yeah, you started off with that and talking about angels. Where did they come from? Okay, well, I want to tell you about my friend, Patricia May. I met Patricia a couple of years ago. She's incredibly sweet. She's, she seems a little shy, and if someone described her, she could be my grandmom. She has such a heart for God. Uh, and she's also a counselor and uh, a master treatment facilitator. She counseled inmates at Delaware's largest prison, the James T. Vaughn Correctional Facility. And she wrote a faith-based residential treatment program based on positive reinforcements and mentorship. And she was told she'd never get it approved in prison, but she knew that God had already preordained it. And she did get the go-ahead, and it was successful. The inmates being released from maximum security and entering Patricia's residential program called My Brother's Keeper were getting a lot out of it. But things were going very badly at this prison because the administrators believed in punishment only, and we're taking away the educational, therapeutic, and enriching programs from the inmates and treating them, now this is a quote, like crap. Mm. The administrators didn't like Patricia, who was actively trying to rehabilitate the inmates. She treated them with kindness and made them feel human, like they had a purpose, and she prayed for them. Now, not only was the My Brother's Keeper program shut down, not only was she being sneered at and treated abominably by her higher-ups, but they were moving her to Building C. Building C was a maximum security building that was a pressure cooker under the inhumane treatment of the prison's current administration. For several weeks, there had been scuttlebutt about a prison riot being planned. Now, Patricia had strong faith, but she was scared. She talked to God constantly. She asked God to let her not be transferred to Building C told her co-workers that she was afraid something bad was going to happen to her. She was afraid she was going to be killed. She continued praying, asking that she not have to work in Building C. But then she prayed, okay, God, your will be done, but please protect me. I'm scared. On February 1st, 2017, as she drove toward the facility, she saw a vision of angels circling above Building C. Wow. Yeah. And in that moment, she knew that was God telling her that he was with her. That morning, the riot broke out. And she was one of four staff members taken hostage. Her captor held her at knife point and said, Miss May, now I don't want to have to hurt you, but if you don't do everything I say, I'm going to have to stab you. And she was so scared. She was violently shaking. Her hands and feet were tied. A hood was put over her head. And she said to him, okay, but if you tie the hood around my neck, I'm going to lose it. So he didn't. And he wheeled her in a chair down the hall, but because the hood wasn't tied, she was able to see the floor. And what she saw horrified her. The riot was already well underway, and it was violent. And she was put in a cell and sat on a metal box. Then she heard the voice of an inmate that had been in her program. And he said, Miss May, I just want you to know that I'm here and I'm going to be checking on you. Over my dead body will they hurt you. Another inmate brought her her own Bible from her office, and she couldn't read it because she had the hood over her head, but it was a great comfort to her to be able to hold it against her chest. Now, the alarms were constantly blaring. Every light in the building was being broken. There was shouting, banging, and other terrifying sounds and smells. Now, there were four young men in the cell with her, she thought, and they saw this dear woman who they... They thought could have been their grandmother, a light in the darkness of that prison who cared about them, shaking in fear. And they felt so protective of her, and they wanted to comfort her in this little cell while the violent riot was taking place outside the door. And one of them said, Miss May, what kind of music do you like? She said, I like contemporary Christian music. 
So they found a radio, but the power was now down in the building, so they couldn't turn it on. And then she heard a voice singing. And she said, it was the most gorgeous, clear voice I'd ever heard. Now, everything that day had been so surreal. She wasn't sure if it was a man or an angel singing. It sounded to her like an angel. And someone put their hand on her shoulder, and she reached up and she held it. And she remembered her vision of the angels encircling this very building that morning. And she remembered that God was with her and that she'd sent, he'd sent angels to protect her. So in the middle of the night, with her hood off, but in the darkness, she told Bible stories to her protectors. And she told them about the divine miracles and healings in her own life. And they did several things to make her more comfortable and, and stayed with her the entire 18 hours of the riot. And when it came time for her to be rescued, she worried that they would come storming in with guns a-blazing and, and kill her protector. So she stood in front of the window of the door. This is 5.30 in the morning. And she was now their angel, their protector. And she told the crew, please don't hurt these guys. And they didn't. And she continues to be their angel. Two of them had been released from prison. One of them is Anthony. And he was the angel who sang to her. Mm. The uh, other two inmates should have been released by now. And she's advocating for them. Now, she doesn't work there anymore. She's still working through her PTSD brought on by the riot. Uh, the nightmares and the moments of reliving the worst moments of that day are lessening. And she now holds a position at Second Chances Farm. And here's what it says on their website. Second Chances Farm nurtures plants and people and our planet by providing returning citizens, that's a more dignified way of saying released inmates, with mentorship programs and green-collar jobs at hydroponic indoor vertical farms in economically distressed communities. Our vision is twofold, to reduce our carbon footprint by growing food locally 365 days a year while replacing recidivism with compassionate capitalism and turning entrepreneurs in residence into agripreneurs. Mm. So now she gets to continue helping these people in a beautiful way. And one of her most moving memories is when she was invited back to the prison holiday worship service and seeing the prison praise and worship team singing carols and walking in as angels singing Angels We Have Heard On High. And by the way, that song that Anthony sang was Will Your Heart and Soul Say Yes? And I'd say that Patricia May said yes, and she still is. Wow. <laughs> so, so in the midst of all of that violence going on, Inmates who were violent people of their own protected her from that violence yes. because of the kindness and love that she had shown to them. Right. Right. And so, I mean, that is a miracle in its true sense. It's certainly a, uh, a story that all of us remember mm. that a, an act of kindness does come back to us when it's, uh, when it's recognized for that. It does. Wow. Well, now you know well. <laughs> <laughs> now we know well, yeah. Well, look, uh, such a moving story. Thank you for, for changing the energy of what I was doing because what I was talking about was the opposite of what you just brought to us. But I, I appreciate the love that you've brought to us through that story and hopefully people will gain a message from it. So